Hello, everyone, everywhere. This is Pastor Robert Thibodeau. Welcome to For Such a Time as This. This is an online revival where we have pastors from coming all over the country, from one end of this nation to the other, that are coming over the next few days to minister words of encouragement and hope to you. And we're just so grateful for the technology that's available. I want to thank, you know, uh, the Christ Summit for allowing us to use this platform to conduct this revival. I want to thank uh, my co-host, uh, Chris Jordan with Team CNE. That has, if it wasn't for him, none of this would happen because he's the, the brains behind the, the mechanics of this operation. And, you know, for each and every pastor and ministry leader across America that has so graciously agreed to devote your time to reaching America at such a time as this with words of encouragement and hope that is so needful right now. And for each and every one of you that's joining us, we are streaming live on, matter of fact, I need to turn that on, don't I? Uh, we're going to be streaming live on Facebook Live. We are streaming live on evangelismradio.com. And this is all designed to reach as many people as possible that with the word of God and with words of hope and encouragement. Hallelujah. And tonight, to kick things off, we have a very special guest, Tim Barton. And Tim, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I do appreciate your time. And Tim is the president of Wall Builders, a national pro-family organization that represents America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on our religious, moral, and constitutional heritage. Wall, Bu Wall Builders has been recognized from coast to coast for his work in education, history, law, and public policy, integrating the elements of biblical faith and morality throughout all aspects of American life and culture. And Tim, I just thank you for coming on the program tonight. Well, Pastor, thanks for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. Uh, normally, it's not virtually like this, but I'm so excited for what you're doing and for what God's going to do over these next several nights. Amen. Amen. Well, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for your word. Your word brings light and life, and right now we need light and we need life. Lord, your word is the truth, and the truth is that this virus has already been defeated in the spirit. Lord, give our leaders wisdom and understanding in the natural how they have to deal with it. But we want to stand on your word. And we thank you, Lord, that right now, today, your word is going forth, not just in America, but around the world. This affects the entire planet. And we thank you, Lord, that your word can minister to people all across this planet right now. Words of hope and words of encouragement. And Lord, we just give to you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Tim, uh, I can't click off here right now because I'm trying to load up this Facebook page, but uh, you take over, man. Perfect. Well, uh, as as was mentioned, as we're getting going, uh, if people have questions along the way, um, I would love to try to answer them. Once I, I'm actually going to share a screen, I'm going to put up a presentation, uh, and at that point, I will not be able to see all of the questions. Um, but but I do want to help maybe encourage people um, as we're navigating this really weird time in culture. Throughout the history of our nation, there have been times when weird things have happened, whether it be pandemics or crisis or wars. And what's interesting is, is even in the history of our nation, there's a lot of people that look at America and the way that history is taught today. A lot of people think America is a really bad nation. We've always been a bad nation. We've always done bad things. And that's really a bad read of history. Because as you study world history, what you recognize is that every nation has always had problems for one singular reason. And that reason is they've always had people. And the reason we can say that is we know what scripture teaches, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so every nation will always have periods where there is sin, where there is crisis, where there is drama, where there are problems. What's been so unique in America, though, is every time that we've had major problems in America, what has led to those problems ending in America largely has been the effort of Christians rising up and God using Christians to help change the course and direction of the nation. Now, I understand this is a little different if we're speaking about a pandemic like a COVID-19 or maybe the swine flu in 2009 or the Spanish flu back in 2018. Certainly that might be different, but in the sense of there have been times of, of economic disruption in America. There have been times of chaos. There have been times when America's even made some really bad and sinful decisions. 
And in those moments, it's been Christians that have led. And so I, I want to show a little bit about some of that history as we do this. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to put up this presentation on the screen. Uh, Pastor, hopefully, uh, if you'll tell me and, and confirm that this appears when it's there. Um, so hopefully you guys can see that this is a picture depicting the presentation of the declaration. Yep, I and, see it. Good. So, so during this time in America, this is at a time when it, right now we are feeling economic chaos back up to the time of the American Revolution. You talk about economic chaos and, and economic uncertainty and, and people's lives being threatened and endangered. We don't often remember the history of our nation. So let me back up and just walk you through a couple quick moments of history. And then we'll, we'll talk about some practical application and especially the role of faith in our lives in America today. So when we did the declaration, this was to separate from King George and what they believed to be the tyranny and oppression. So when they wrote the declaration, I, I, I joke that this really was the greatest breakup letter that was ever written in the history of breakups, right? Where in this letter, we said, first of all, it's not us, it's all you, King. And then we listed 27 reasons he was the problem. Well, in the declaration, this was drafted primarily. Uh, Jefferson was considered the leader of that. He was only 33 years old when he did that. And I remember uh, I'm now 37, working on 38. And I remember when I was a teenager thinking that 33, those people are pretty old and they're probably smart. Life is totally figured out. Right. They know everything. Well, when I hit 33, I realized 33 year olds are not that smart. We don't have life figured out. And, and now that I'm past 33, I really don't think it's that old. But when Jefferson did the declaration, he came up with some brilliant thoughts. And certainly there was a team helping him write this. But when you read the declaration, there's a couple phrases we know. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. And, and I want to unpack that a little bit because Jefferson starts off with we hold these truths to be self-evident. And we live in a culture today that is, isn't even sure truth exists, right? We, we question, well, are there absolutes? And really, isn't it up to every individual to decide? We used to know in America, no, nope, there are absolutes. And we knew that largely we, we find truth in the Bible, that is where you go to find truth is what the word of God teaches, where Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. And, and also John 8, 32, he says that you would know the truth and truth sets you free. Truth has to exist or for us as Christians, life really doesn't make a lot of sense. And really even beyond us as Christians, truth should be one of the biggest things we try to focus on in life. What is true? Well, the founding father said that there were certain truths that we should build a nation on. And they started off that all men are created equal that we have rights that come from God, that government's primary purpose is to protect those rights. And what's interesting about this is Jefferson said that these truths are self-evident, which means they're obvious to everybody. But I want you to think for a second. If you look at the idea that everybody's created equal, that inalienable rights come from God and that government's primary role is to protect our rights, are those truths obvious to the world? Now, I would contend they're not obvious to the world because even today, Okay, not even like founding of America hundreds of years ago. Today, not every nation believes in equality because you have places like India that still has a caste system. Okay, you, you have places where there are different levels and hierarchies of people and even differences between genders where, oh, just for an example, Saudi Arabia last year passed a new law where for the first time women were allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. And they did this to show, look, we now are treating people equal. If you're just now doing that, right, the idea of equality is not the same as we think it is in America. And, and this is what's kind of crazy. Sometimes we look at history from where we are today and think everybody should know what we know today. And that's just not true historically, but it's also not true in reality. Even if you take the idea that rights come from God, do you think in China? People believe rights come from God because because their government doesn't or North Korea, right? We can go down the list of nations who they don't believe that you have God given rights. They believe that you have government given rights and the government can tell you what to do and when to do and how to do. Or even the idea that government's primary role is to protect its citizens. Most nations of the world don't see that as government's primary role. In fact, even a lot of Americans don't see that. And here's what's interesting. When the founding fathers did this, King George didn't see those as obvious truths either. So why would the founding fathers say that these are truths that are obvious? Everybody should know these truths. 
I would point out that those truths are only obvious to people who know what the Bible says. If you know what the Bible says, then, for example, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we know that we have been created in God's image. Male and female, he created us in his image. He created us. OK, that's what the Bible says. Well, this is where we get the idea that we are created equal. If you don't know and believe the Bible, guess what you don't know and believe? That all people are equal because that is a biblical value. The idea that we have God-given rights, well, guess where that came from? We'll go to Genesis when Adam and Eve are in the garden. And in the Garden of Eden, God has given them the right to life, the right to speak, right? You can go through the rights even outlined in the Bill of Rights, but life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, God gave all of those in the Garden of Eden. Those were God-given rights, and government doesn't exist as far as the Bible is concerned until Genesis chapter 9. And when it exists, this is what God tells Noah, is that from now on, if there's a murder in society, if man sheds blood by man, his blood will be shed, meaning that we're not going to let that murder go free anymore. But God was teaching that government's role is to protect people's life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, to protect their God-given rights, this is what's interesting. When you look at the Declaration, the ideas in the Declaration largely were shaped by the philosophy learned in the Bible. And today people would say, now, wait a second. Could we really say the Declaration that these guys had biblical ideas? Well, early historians used to acknowledge this. In fact, even the early 1900s, Clinton Rossiter was a professor at Cornell University. He wrote a book called The Seed Time of the Republic. And in this book, he identified the six people that he said came up with really the ideas that were used to birth America. And the six people he mentioned were Benjamin Franklin, Richard Bland, the Reverend Thomas Hooker, the Reverend Roger Williams, the Reverend John Wise, and the Reverend Jonathan Mayhew. Now he said those six people are the ones who promoted the ideas that really America was birthed on. Notice that of those six, four of them were ministers of the gospel. And let me just give you an example. One of the guys was the Reverend John Wise. The Reverend John Wise was a pastor in the late 1600s, early 1700s. There's a book from 1717 that is his collection of sermons. We actually own one of those at Wall Builders. And in this collection of sermons, he taught a sermon where he explained that taxation without representation was actually tyranny. He also taught a sermon where he said that God's preferred form of government is the consent of the governed. In another sermon, he taught that all people are equal in God's eyes and God has given us inalienable rights that is verbiage that appears directly in the declaration that came from this pastor's pulpit as he's teaching the people about how the Bible applies to different areas of life. Well, that was in 1717 was the book of sermons. However, the book that we have at Wall Builders was reprinted in 1772 and it was reprinted by the Sons of Liberty. Now, the Sons of Liberty were from Massachusetts and they wanted the people of Massachusetts to know what does the Bible say about our rights, about our liberties, about our freedoms? So in 1772, they reprinted this book of sermons from John Wise, and they distributed it to all of the patriots they could find and said, read this book. So in 1776, when you see the declaration done, well, John Hancock, who was the president of Congress, was from Massachusetts, part of the Sons of Liberty. John Adams, who was also from Massachusetts, who's on the Committee of Five that drafted the declaration, was from Massachusetts, part of the Sons of Liberty. These ideas that were outlined in the Bible appeared in the Declaration, which is why historians used to acknowledge the influence of pastors, specifically John Wise as an example. Here's one from historian B.F. Morris. He said, some of the most glittering sentences of the immortal Declaration are almost literal quotations from this essay of John Wise. It was used as a political textbook in the great struggle for freedom. Even President Calvin Coolidge on the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration Outside of Independence Hall, he delivered a speech, and in this speech, he remembered John Wise. He said, the ideas of the Declaration can very largely be traced back to what John Wise was writing. Here was the doctrine of equality of popular sovereignty and inalienable rights asserted by Wise. The reason I point that out, when you look at founding fathers like Sam Adams, he was there in 1772. He was considered the, the father of the American Revolution. He was an incredible patriot who was promoting these biblical ideas. Well, he was one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty. And one of the things the Sons of Liberty did is they started the Committees of Correspondence, or at least they were connected with the Sons of Liberty. And the Committees of Correspondence, the idea was to let all of the other Americans know what they were thinking so that we could think consistent thoughts. And it wasn't a bunch of individual people going different directions. We want to have a unified thought in this, a unified voice. So he wrote an essay in 1772, part of the Committees of Correspondence, and it was sent out to other patriots and other colonies and other states. 
But here's what he said. We need to think the same on an area. Here's how he explained their perspective. He said the rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament. Now think about this for a second. He says, if you want to understand the way we're thinking as colonists, as, as patriots, as Christians, you should read the Bible and, and really study the, the, the great lawgiver, right? Jesus, study the head of this whole thing, which is that's found in the New Testament is where you learn about him. This is Sam Adams saying you should study the Bible. Today, it would be weird for people to think that the founding fathers or maybe even the Sons of Liberty, the committees of correspondence, were telling Americans study the Bible so that we're thinking right with the issues we're dealing with. And yet that's really what happens when you study historical documents. This is exactly what they said. Now, it's contrary to what we hear today. Today, we hear the founding fathers were really secular, that maybe they were atheists or maybe they were agnostic or, or maybe they were deist. And when you look at this idea of them being atheist, agnostic, and deist, it really doesn't line up when you study what they did. For example, the very first time they ever met, they opened with prayer, and then they had an official call of a national prayer movement. Well, by 1815, there were more than 1,400 calls to prayer for the nation or for states from presidents, from governors, and from Congress. That's pretty powerful when you consider it that when there were moments of need, they said, what should we do? We should pray and ask God for help. Now, I would say we are in a very similar situation. Anytime a nation, anytime a family, anytime a business, anytime a state goes through a crisis, the first response ought to be, let's pray and ask God for help. This is what we did as a nation. The founding fathers were leading in this thought. And, and that doesn't mean that every single one of them had the same maybe orthodox theological position that you and I hold. Although many of them were Bible believing Christians, maybe not all of them were, but even the ones who weren't recognized the value of prayer and of Christianity and the Bible, because even guys like Benjamin Franklin, who we would agree he wasn't really a Christian, we could acknowledge that, but he still said that we should pray to God because even though he didn't, by saying he wasn't a Christian, he wasn't sure of the divinity of Jesus. But he did believe there was a God who created the heavens and the earth, and that God was still involved in our world today, and that God should receive the proper honor, and we should call out to him when we need help. So he definitely wasn't a secular guy the way we sometimes hear today. But let me just give you an example of, uh, of founding fathers and some of their thoughts of faith. John Adams' name, most people have heard of. He was the, the first vice president of, the, of America, the second president of America. But he talked about the role of faith and specifically the Bible in America. Here's one of the things he said. I have examined all religions as a result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. I think it's interesting. He said, I've examined all religions because one of the things that we certainly seem to have lost in America is the idea of apologetics. Most Christians don't really know why we believe what we believe or why we can trust what the Bible says, why we can trust some of these theological positions. Well, if you don't know what you believe, it's easy. This is where Jesus would talk about, right, that, that when, when the sower went and sowed seed, that some fell on the good soil and then some on the road and some, right, were, were choked out and, and some were eaten by the birds. If you don't know why you believe what you believe, it allows the opportunity for doubt, for disbelief to come in and take it away. Well, for John Adams to say, I've examined all religions and nothing compares to the Bible, that means he's done some study. He went even further with his defense of the Bible. He said, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. Now, just for a second, even especially in the midst of this pandemic and chaos, imagine if, if the leaders of our nation, the leaders of our states, the leaders of our community, our mayors, right, city council, if they said, hey, what we need to do to help bring some order and stability, let's just start doing what the Bible says. Let's follow the Bible because this is what John Adams says. Suppose that there was some place and the only laws they followed, they learned from the Bible. Here was his conclusion. What a utopia, what a paradise would this region be? Now, I want you to think about that. That is a president of the United States, a founding father. He signed the declaration. He was one of the guys negotiating the end of the American Revolution, very involved founding father and said, nothing would be better for any nation than following the Bible. Well, his son had some very similar sentiments I think are super powerful. Now, John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, became the sixth president of the United States. 
But one of the things he said about the Bible was with regard to the history contained in the Bible, it is not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it as it is shameful to be ignorant of it. Now, just at face value, that's a powerful statement, but I would, I would almost disagree with that on face value because he said it's not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it. I would say, wait a second. It's super praiseworthy to know the Bible. That's a really good thing to know the Bible, and it is a good thing to know the Bible, but, but there's some context to why he said that. Because at, at that period in, in American history, most students learn to read by using the Bible. So most parents were using the Bible to teach their kids to read. plus two was, we would say that's a little shameful. And if you did know what it was, we wouldn't be super impressed because you should know that it should be obvious. And that was his point. It shouldn't be super impressive for someone to know what should be obvious, but it'd be shameful for you not to know what should be obvious. And, and this is what he thought about the knowledge of the Bible. And, and he learned that, let me back up. He learned that from mom and dad, right? So Abigail and John Adams were really incredible people in early America. The relationship is so many neat aspects of them. But when John Adams is a diplomat to America, he's going overseas to help bring him into the war. Abigail is now the one at home taking care of everything. So, right, she's, she's helping homeschool the kids. Um, she's helping run the farm, the finances. And, and she was absolutely amazing in her leadership and all the things she did. Well, one of the things that was noted about Abigail Adams is she was very faithful to go to church. And not only was she faithful to go to church, she was faithful to take the family to church. Outside of their church in Massachusetts, there is a statue that was built that is depicting her and John Quincy Adams going to church. And that's him holding a Bible because that's every Sunday they went to church regardless of conditions. They're going to church every Sunday. So John Quincy Adams grows up in this environment. He grows up learning about faith and the importance of faith. Actually, as he's growing up, one of the cool things he got to do was a Massachusetts Minuteman used to practice their musket drills outside of his house. And so his dad allowed John Quincy Adams, who's only eight years old, to get a musket and to go do musket drills with the Minutemen. And this is to me, this is the equivalent of when I was growing up, I, I as an eight year old, my parents had bought me a single shot bolt action 22 because we were in the country. And so they would they would use that and they taught me how to shoot and gun safety. But but just imagine, right? If my dad would have said, all right, Tim, here's your 22. Now you get to go train with the Navy SEALs. That would have been the most amazing thing for any eight-year-old to imagine, right? Like dad wins father of the year award. Well, as an eight-year-old, he got to train with the Massachusetts Minutemen. He also got to go with his dad when he got a little older. He got to go with his dad over to Europe as, as John Adams is trying to negotiate an end to the war. Well, while he's over there, one of the really funny stories Apparently, he was supposed to write his mom and, and let her know that he arrived safely over to Europe. And, and either he forgot to write the letter or the letter got lost somewhere. What we know is that Abigail Adams wrote him a letter. And, and in this letter, she expressed concern because I didn't get this letter. And so the, the, kind of the tone of the letter that she writes him is, look, I don't know if you're alive, but if you are, you're in trouble because you were supposed to have written me. But then what she writes him really is fascinating to me because she reminds him of the example he should set even over in Europe. She says, adhere to those religious sentiments and principles which were early instilled into your mind. And remember, you are accountable to your maker for all your words and actions. And I love that thought that she reminds him just because I'm not there to watch you. God is still watching you. You're still accountable to him. And it got even more intense. She said, dear as you are to me. I had much rather you should find your grave in the ocean or an untimely death crop you in your infant years rather than see you in a moral, wicked, or graceless child. Now imagine mom saying, I would rather you drown in the ocean, right? And then love mom. That, that's a crazy thing to say, except what she's doing is she's saying, I want you to understand it's better that you die secure in your faith than maybe that you reject faith and then you live a long life, but but your eternal security, you, you've gone a different direction. It reminds me a lot of Proverbs 22, 6, which says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. She was instilling in him an eternal perspective. 
that your eternal position is more important than some temporary pleasure where you are here on earth, which is an amazing thought. So, so he is with his father over in Europe. Um, when he's 11 years old, he's over in Paris with his dad. When he's 14 years old, he actually gets to go before the throne of Catherine the Great in Russia with the, the official diplomatic team. And one of his roles as a 14 year old was as an interpreter because he was already fluent in six languages as a 14 year old. Then as America becomes a nation, we write a constitution under George Washington. He's a diplomat. George Washington says that he was the best diplomat America ever had. Under his father, John Adams, John Adams again chooses his son, John Quincy Adams, to be a diplomat. He, again, is one of the lead diplomats for America. Under Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams was elected to be a U.S. senator. Then under James Madison, Madison again chose him to be a diplomat and a top diplomat for America. And while he was over in Europe and Russia at this time, one of the things he realized was that he had a son in America. And he had a family at that time. He was married, had kids. But he had his older son, John, or excuse me, George Washington Adams, was growing up and he said, I, I'm concerned that my son doesn't know things that if I was there, I would tell him. So he wrote his son a series of nine letters. His son was 10 years old. And in those nine letters, he was explaining to his son how to study the Bible every single day and how to get the most out of Bible study, how to journal, how to have a prayer journal, I mean, just remarkable stuff. And, and, and I want to show you part of what he told his 10 year old son in one of those letters. He said, no book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated upon as the Bible. I have myself for many years made it a practice to read through the Bible once every year. My custom is to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from bed. It employs about an hour of my time and seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning the day. Now, Wall Builders, we actually have one of his journals. And in this journal, he was outlining how he would read the Bible every morning. Like he said, four or five chapters, except... He would outline that he would read it in several different languages and then compare them back to Greek or Hebrew. He said, well, the Russians did a really good job with this verse in Greek, but the French did a better job on this verse. And he would compare it back to Greek or to Latin. I mean, just this guy's Bible study was amazing. Well, he's telling his 10 year old son, right? Every morning, start off studying the Bible. And then he tells them why. He says, I've always endeavored to read it with the same spirit, which I now recommend to you. That is with the intention and desire that it may contribute to my advance in wisdom and virtue. And this is a, an amazing thought. He says, son, the reason you should read and study the Bible is to make sure you have, have Yeah. Sam, um, we lost your uh, video and your voice. If you can just reset that real quick, please. All right, can you guys hear me? I can see I can see your video. It just might take a minute for your style to come back with it. Go ahead and try. Go ahead and talk. You want me to keep going? There you go. You're yeah, good check to go. test one, two. There you go. Yeah. Robert. <laughs> All Robert, right. Is that gonna mess you up? What, you right? Well, I'm, I'm almost at the end. You want me to finish this out? Yeah, finish it out. OK, perfect. So so John Quincy Adams, he's in Congress for 17 years, leading the fight against slavery. Um, he had petitions on a daily basis trying to end slavery and he was largely unsuccessful. And so one day a reporter came to him and they said, Mr. Adams, you have fought for year after year after year to end slavery. And there have been no visible signs of your success. Why do you continue when you haven't really been successful? And his answer was brilliant. His answer, he said, was based on his life motto. His life motto was duty is ours, results are God's. And what he told the reporter is the reason that I am fighting against slavery is because it's the right thing to do. It's up to God what happens after that. It's just up to me to do the right thing. And this was his position 
And so one of the cool things looking at, at John Quincy Adams and his position is today we are, are seeing a lot of chaos in our culture and world around us. And there's a lot of Christians that are, are, are helping navigate and trying to figure out, too, what do we do um, I, spiritually? I think certainly there's a lot of things we can draw from this where for a lot of people, they haven't really done a good job with Sabbaths or good time with family or right. I, I think God might be saying to some people, we need to slow down. We need to do a reset. We need to right, get reconnected with our spiritual life. And this is something that historically so often when when people were fighting the cultural battles that needed to be fought, it was the Christians that were connected with God. Right, John Quincy Adams trying to teach his son. The most important thing you can do every day is spend time in God's word. And then he's dedicated his whole life fighting slavery. Part of the reason was he was motivated by his faith. And what I would encourage right now is this is where as Christians, we ought to be pouring more into Bible study, more into prayer, more in time with God than ever before, because we recognize our cultures in chaos. And this is where God so often through history will raise up leaders from his own, right, from the remnant that he's preserved, people that love and serve him and use them to be answers and solution in culture. And by the way, the end of John Quincy Adams story, his last term in Congress, there was a freshman who was elected. And John Quincy Adams, as a leader of the anti-slavery movement, is is continuing every day giving speeches and, and right trying to stir up more people to oppose slavery. Well, this young freshman was convinced that, all right, I'm going to help fight slavery. Well, John Quincy Adams then dies, and so he can no longer lead the movement, but the young freshman says, all right, I want to help. I want to do something. Well, in Congress, you only serve for two years, and you have to run for re-election. So the freshman ran for re-election, but he got defeated. He then ran as a senator and got defeated. He ran for state office and got defeated. He didn't win another election until he became the president of the United States, and that was Abraham Lincoln. And what's amazing is Abraham Lincoln was able to fulfill a lot of what John Quincy Adams' passion and motivation, what John Quincy Adams never lived to see the end of slavery, but he helped mentor and train the very guy who brought an end to slavery in America. And this is one of the things I would encourage us with too. A lot of us, we've been praying for revival for decades in America, and I'm believing that we're starting to see some of that revival. But one of the things I can tell you is that we might not see America get back exactly where we want her to be in our lifetime, but who knows that God might use us to raise up, train, mentor, disciple the very people that God uses to usher in this next wave of revival to help change our nation, to change the world. And this is where, as Christians, we need to follow what John Quincy Adams said his life motto was, the duty is ours, results are God's, because God has called us to be faithful. And it's a crazy thought. God hasn't always called us to be successful. He's called us to be faithful and leave the results up to him. And this is where now for us, we want to be faithful and doing what God has called us to do. Faithful and loving others, faithful in prayer, praying for our leaders and all those in government authority, faithful in our Bible study, faithful in our connection and communion with God. But this is where as Christians, more than ever, we have a culture and a world looking for answers. And we just happen to be the ones who are equipped with the truth because the truth is found in God's word. But if we're going to be able to share truth, we have to know what truth is, which means we have to spend time with God, time in his word, so we can share what God reveals to us, what God's word said, and we can be the hope for a culture and a world in need. Pastor Robert, I know I can keep talking for hours, but I know you have a whole lineup scheduled, so I need to be quiet and let other people have their chance too. Or I can keep talking if I'm the only one here. No, you're not the only one here, Tim. I think sometimes it just takes a second for the kind of system to kind of keep catch up with everything here. Um, I was a youth pastor and teacher for a lot of years. I can filibuster as long as I need to. And I can talk for hours and I have at times, um, but I did want to be respectful and I, and I know I've, I've bumped up against my time. So I, I, I want to hand it back over uh, pastor or whoever's taking it from here. Bob, are you on? His mic is showing on, but he's not showing on. Well, uh, what I want to say real quick with this is this, the history was so rich and, uh, and, and you nailed a couple of things. And one of the things you said about faithfulness over successfulness uh, just really on point, man. I just, I really appreciate your just 
uh, I don't know, your candor and your just strength and just standing on that truth. So appreciate you. Absolutely. And thanks for having me on. I'm so excited for what you guys are doing and what God's going to do with this, especially not just over the next couple of days, but as it's posted online, people are going to see it. Uh, we believe that God's going to use this. It's going to go far and wide and lives are going to be changed. Amen. Amen. Well, I mean, uh, Bob, Bob has hopped off and hopped on. I think we have a little bit of a time gap. So, I mean, if there's anything specific you want to maybe pray about or anything to close out your session and just kind of walk us into the next one, man, that would be that would be awesome. Man, I, I would love to. And actually, so one of the cool things I, I mentioned on part of that presentation is there were over 1,400 calls to prayer by the government, president, uh, governors, Congress by 1815. And while we own over 800 official government calls to prayer, we own several. This is one from John Hancock. And this is a fasting, humiliation, and prayer proclamation. Uh, and it, John Hancock at 22 of government. Massachusetts. But one of the things when they were praying and they had a time of prayer and fasting, I want to read part of what John Hancock encouraged all the people to pray for in Massachusetts. He said, calling upon ministers and people of every denomination to assemble on this day uh, in their respective congregations that with true contrition of heart, we may confess our sins, resolve to forsake them and implore the divine forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Not only was John Hancock encouraging everybody we need to pray for our state, pray for the issues of our state, but John Hancock said we also need to pray that if people don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so one of the things as we finish that I want to encourage us even to pray for is that God uses this chaos and this pandemic to draw people unto him and right, maybe whether it's the prodigal son or people who have never heard, but just like John Hancock said, look, when we're in a time of prayer and fasting, let's make sure we remember to pray for people to be drawn to God that if they don't know Jesus Christ, they would know Jesus Christ. So I'm going to finish in prayer. If you guys will join me, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in the midst of situations and chaos, we know that you have you've never left us or forsaken us, God, that even at times when we are, are faithless, you still remain faithful because you cannot deny or disown who you are as part of your character and nature. God, we know that nothing will separate us from your love. And so in this moment, God, wherever we are in our life, if we have friends that are, are, are going through part of this pandemic, uh, if our family members, if we are, God, if, if it's, it's economic and, and the job instability and the chaos, God, whatever it is, I'm so grateful that, that you've said we can come and cast our cares to you because you care for us. And so, God, right now we turn over this situation to you. God, we ask that you would help bring peace to people's minds, to their hearts. Um, God, that you would guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. And God, that in the midst of this, that as people are looking for answers, God, that you would draw them unto you. And God, that you would use us to be the voice that would speak truth in a culture that doesn't know truth, that is looking for answers. God, use us to make a difference. And God, we ask that you would bring healing to people that are, are sick. Um, God, bring help and comfort to people that are hurting. And God, bring an end to this coronavirus and bring health and healing back to our nation, both spiritually and physically. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can you hear me? Amen. Amen. Now, Pastor Bob, it looks like he popped pop back on. Uh, so, Pastor, if you're here, go ahead and, and step on in. But, Tim, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, brother. That was powerful. Amen. And Tim, can you hear me right now? Yes, sir. I can hear you now. Okay. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I had to log back out and come back in. Uh, technology is great as long as it works the way it's supposed to. That's Praise it. But that, that was an awesome, awesome presentation. I, every time I hear you and your dad speaking about the, the, the Christian foundation of this nation, it just motivates me so much to, to just want to go out there and, and you know, shake people say, don't you understand? You know? Yeah. Uh, I, I appreciate it. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. I mean, does anybody have any questions? If you got a question, put it in chat on the public chat real quick. And, uh, you know, Tim has a couple minutes here and we'll, we'll ask him a question. Uh, how is this? affecting you know everything going on right now how is this affecting you guys at wall builders you know i i think we're in the same position that that so many americans are um that we're we're having to slow some things down and do some things differently um but you know one of the things that as christians we have assurance of is that god is always going to lead god direct um and, and help us in these situations and so uh, things are a lot slower. You know, we definitely didn't plan on shutting down all of our travel and so much of our engagements and things that we do because we travel nationally 
Um, we speak nationally. We do hundreds of events around uh, the United States every single year. And so a lot of it has now changed, but some positives we've seen from that is we, we've been trying to, to finish um, a couple books for a while. So now we're able to work on some of that. Um, some of the stories, even that we talked about, we're writing a history book, uh, but it's going to be yeah. how God used people from all the way from Columbus coming forward. And, and specifically, right, we highlight these weren't perfect people, but the history of the world is God using imperfect people to do something great through imperfect people. Yeah. And so that's, right. that's kind of the story we're helping uh, tell. And so we're, we're hoping that's going to be out the summer. Um, and then we're just we're trusting God's faithfulness to help. Um, continue to provide just like I know so many people who are, are watching and, and going to watch in the future. Um, we're just praying and believing that that God is going to help continue to provide in sometimes unexpected ways. Um, but we're just navigating this one day at a time. Amen. Amen. Well, I do appreciate your time because I know with everything going on, turkey season getting ready to start, you know, out there in Texas, you're, you're a little little busy right now. But, uh, uh, you know, hunting season is one of the few things that I try to take a couple days off to go enjoy the outdoors. <laughs> I, I love the outdoors more than anything. And so I am super excited to go social distance by myself in the woods uh, with go. God in creation. So I'm so excited about it. Amen. Amen. Well, Tim, I do appreciate it. Now, folks, uh, if you're watching this or you're listening to me on evangelism radio right now, go to wallbuilders.com. The resources that are available on that website is, I mean, it, I can't even begin to describe it. I mean, you see some of the, the historical things that, that he's got in his background and, you know, the documents he shared. Now, they won't give you the original document, okay? <laughs> but they have what looks like original documents. I mean, they're great recreations. And you can purchase those and hang them up on your wall. I've got, you know, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and, and the Declaration of Independence in my office. So, you know, these, and people say, wow, where'd you get that? I tell them, wall builders. I mean, they, they, they sell that to you? Yeah. <laughs> but no, well, it, it, there is a lot Pastor, of stuff there. A lot of I'll say too, uh, if I can interrupt, one of the cool things, I, I showed this uh, prayer proclamation from John Hancock. We actually have reprinted some of those original prayer proclamations as well. Uh, and we sell this for just a couple of dollars, but especially at a time when the nation needs prayer, that could be a really cool thing. And especially now a lot of parents are having to homeschool. This is a great time to help bring some faith back to education, right? Bring Amen. prayer, um, the, even the Pledge of Allegiance back to school. We can do that again. But especially as, as now parents are helping navigate for their kids and having to teach some things that a, a lot of these kids were never going to learn in school. We do have a lot of resources, wallbuilders.com, as you mentioned, some cool things they can purchase. But also, we, we're all over social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, and we have all kinds of, of videos of short stories that are there that specifically designed for classrooms. Um, so there's a lot of things there for parents as they're navigating this homeschool world right now. Yeah, amen. And Wall Builders Live is their radio program. You can get it on iTunes as well. And, you know, I expressed before we started, uh, my thanks to Tim and, and his dad, David Barton, and, and Wall Builders team. They were one of the first major ministries to agree to allow Evangelism Radio share their programming over our radio station way back 10 years ago. And they've been on twice a day for 10 years, seven days a week. So praise the Lord. I, I do appreciate that, Tim. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and, and pray one more time as we you know, allow Tim to, to slide out and we'll bring our next speaker up, which is Dr. D. Stokes. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to hear the foundation upon which this nation was laid, which was the Bible, which was your word. And Lord, we thank you that at such a time as this, you're drawing people back to yourself. For those that do not know you right now, we pray this would be such a time that they will come to know who the true Savior is. And Lord, we thank you right now that, that you're moving all across this land, drawing people to you and enlarging the body of Christ at such a time as this. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.